Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to wait a little bit as people continue to file in. Just sit tight. We'll get started soon. Since we've got a few people in here, um, I'm just going to start with the housekeeping stuff and then I will introduce our panelists. So first of all, hello everyone and welcome to the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Thank you for joining us for this panel um, on the contamination of the Wahoo Aquifer and the fight to shut down Red Hill. My name is Kieran Gay and I will be moderating this panel. I have a few announcements first. Um, so don't worry if you can't see yourself, this is a Zoom webinar. So all of the attendees are automatically muted with videos off. Um, so you will only be able to see the panelists. Also throughout the panel, if you have a question, please free, uh, feel free to use the Q&A function. Um, our panelists will complete the presentation and then there will be a Q&A session at the end where they can answer your questions. Um, so feel free to submit those as the presentation goes on. Um, let's see. Um, also, um, after the panelists begin speaking, um, we will be sending out a link through the Q&A function containing instructions on how to do the following things. Um, first, for the legal professionals in the audience, there will be instructions on how to obtain CLE credits for your attendance here. Um, and secondly, um, there will be instructions on how to donate to our alumni board, Friends of Land Air Water, which provides stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships. So look out for the link during the panel. Lastly, the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed from the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, Community of Oregon, and the Confederated um, Tribes of Silets, Indians of Oregon, and continue to make important contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Pilk would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya, pe Kalapuya peoples of, in the Willamette Valley and express our respect for the indigenous nations of Oregon. Um, I'm now gonna introduce our panelists. Um, Wayne Tanaka, the director of the Sierra Club of Hawaii, came to the Sierra Club after serving for a decade in the public policy program at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. His passion for native ecosystems and community-based resource management also led him to serve on the board of directors here of the Conservation Council of Hawaii and on the founding board of the then newly minted Kuaina Ulu. Oh. Would you mind uh, pronouncing that for me, Wayne? Uh, sure. Uh, Kuaina Ulu Awamo. Thank you so much. Pardon me for um, not doing my research. Um, Wayne Tanaka has also authored and co-authored um, book chapters, chapters and essays um, on many relevant issues um, surrounding um, Hawaii and politics, fisheries man management, indigenous foods, um, sovereignty, and um, the intersection of race and politics. Um, also, we have here with us today, David Kimo Frankel. Um, David Kimo Frankel is a distinguished attorney working for the Sierra Club of Hawaii. He has been fighting uh, the exploitation of Oahu's resources by the U.S. Navy at Red Hill for the past five years. In 2017, Frankel received the Susan E. Miller Award for service to the Sierra Club members for his work and dedication. Um, I will now turn things over to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirin, um, and uh, to everyone for joining us here today. Um, uh, you know, this this situation with the Red Hill bulk fuel storage facility, uh, it's 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 an ongoing crisis that uh, threatens to turn into a catastrophe, uh, existential catastrophe for life as we know it here on Oahu. And so it's still very important that as many people as as possible uh, get engaged, understand what's going on with this issue, get engaged, and, and hopefully you know help join this fight to save our water and save our way of life here on Oahu. Um, so I have a, a PowerPoint presentation that I will bring up now. Okay, uh, and so uh, along with me, as Kieran mentioned, is uh, David Kimo Franco. He's an attorney for, for the Sierra Club of Hawaii, uh, is, uh, in many of our legal interventions around Red Hill, uh, among other campaigns. Uh, he was also a former ex uh, executive director, I think in the 90s. So he's basically my, my great -grand grandfather in, in the Sierra <laughs> Club genealogy. Uh, yeah, okay, so without further ado, um, so today I will talk about 
Um, first, I'll start with some fast facts about the Mauna Loa Waimalu Aquifer, which is our uh, EPA Region 9 sole source aquifer uh, for Oahu. Um, and then I'll talk about the Red Hill facility, where it came from, uh, some of uh, uh, the characteristics of this facility, uh, and, and, and where it's located with respect to this aquifer. Uh, then I'll talk about the current crisis we're facing uh, with the water system for 93,000 residents here on Oahu uh, now contaminated with fuel uh, that originated from this facility. Uh, and then I'll talk about some ongoing concerns uh, uh, where basically as bad as the current situation is, we are potentially looking at a far, uh, far worse catastrophe uh, that again may impact life as we know on this island for potentially uh, generations. Um, and then we'll talk about the campaign that we're engaging in to shut down this facility before it's too late. Uh, Kimo Franco will uh, go into detail about some of the legal interventions that we've engaged in and are engaging in. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some of the legislative initiatives and the grassroots initiatives that um, we're working on. Um, so with that, uh, so I think as a starting point, it's, it's really important to reflect on the waters of Wanalua. Uh, in any island setting, fresh water is, is you know, precious, in Hawaii even more so. And for Wanalua, where this Red Hill facility is located, the waters of that, um, of that region are, are singularly sacred. So, you know, there's origin stories, Molelo, that talk about um, how uh, Kamavai Luolani, who is the, the son of Papa and Wakea, um, settled in this valley after the discovery of water um, by his wife, uh, and through his settlement, that is uh, that this era became a Paliuli, kind of like a Garden of Eden, from which um, people emerged and uh, and were supported by the abundance of the area. Um, and um, this uh, you know, singularly important nature of this aquifer is, in fact, reflected in how it has provided for life on this island for millennia. Um, so the, the waters of Moalua they fed the the brackish estuary areas that um, created fisheries of renowned abundance. There's a huge local or fish pond complex that was built um, in this region in what is now known as Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Malka, the upper lands were well cultivated. There were royal lands uh, that were known for you know, famous taro patches fed by springs uh, connected to this groundwater source. Um, and in modern times, uh, this aquifer has now allowed for uh, the development of Oahu as we know it. So essentially it serves, uh, it, well, it has provided 20% of um, the water um, for uh, the, the most populous region of the most populous island of Oahu. So essentially um, everywhere from Halava to Mauna Loa, so the bottom, uh, the southeastern quadrant of the island, which includes our industrial sector, includes uh, downtown Honolulu, Waikiki, Kahala, um, other places you may know of. And, and it's about 400,000 people that reside in this area, as well as you know, the majority of major hospitals, schools, businesses. Um, and so it continues to be, again, a foundation of life as we know it here in Oahu. Um, and it's also, I think, notable that the water we have in, this, in, in Hawaii and Oahu in particular is, uh, super pure. It's some of the purest water in the world um, because of the location of our islands, uh, because of their age, the height of our mountains, the characteristics of our native watersheds. We are blessed in having some of the purest water uh, in the world. So there's a product score for water purity. It goes from zero to a thousand. Um, the water in Oahu is rated at 920, um, which is crazy because when you look at other places, um, you know, other places in the US, they, they don't break 800. If you look at bottled water, uh, you're not going to see bottled water that breaks 800 either. So our water is, is super, super fresh and, uh, and pure. Um, and that brings us to the Red Hill facility. Um, so in the 1940s, uh, the US Navy uh, built a boat fuel storage facility in Kapu Kaki, uh, which is a hill in Mauna Loa uh, that was, uh, uh, that's located about uh, just 100 feet above this groundwater aquifer. Um, each, there's 20 tanks in this facility. Each one is 25 stories tall. Uh, they can each hold about 12.5 million gallons of fuel. And the, um, when these tanks were installed, there's a steel liner that, uh, was, that's used to contain the fuel. So this is the only thing that really keeps the fuel contained. And the steel liner, when new, was a quarter inch thick. So if you uh, take a hydro flask, if you were to shrink these tanks down to the size of a hydro flask, like a 36 ounce, ounce hydro flask, uh, their walls would be roughly the thickness of tin foil uh, and, and not heavy duty tin foil, but just you know, like a regular, regular stuff you have in your kitchen. Um, and again, these are when the tanks are brand new back, uh, back in the 1940s. 
Um, currently, there's about over 100 million gallons of, of fuel that continue to be stored in about 14 of these, of these uh, super big tanks. Um, two of them have been decommissioned and four are currently empty um, uh, for inspection and repairs. So, uh, but, so yeah, so essentially there's about 14 tanks, each with about 10 million gallons of fuel. They don't fill them up all the way uh, these days because of uh, issues with corrosion uh, near the tops of the tanks. Um, and these tanks have, and this facility has leaked th almost throughout its entire lifetime. So what we've been able to quantify is that at least 180,000 gallons have been released from this facility, start, starting from like the 1940s. Uh, we know that these historic releases um, have infiltrated the substrate below this farm. There's uh, indications that you know these historical releases have actually hit the groundwater table below the Red Hill facility. Um, and then that brings us to the current crisis, uh, to November of last year, uh, when um, folks started on the Navy's water system, started en masse reporting that their tap water smelled like fuel. When the sprinklers went, on, went onto the fields, it smelled like gasoline had been poured all over them. Uh, people were started getting rashes, uh, pets were getting sick and dying. Uh, uh, just uh, um, clearly there was something wrong. Uh, the Navy's refrain was that there was no indication that the water was unsafe to drink um, for a few days. Um, but eventually, uh, obviously it turned out that the water system hadn't contaminated. And so on the right hand side of your screen, that's a water sample from the Red Hill shaft, which is where the Navy uh, draws much of his, or used to draw much of its water um, for their system. Uh, so the system served 93,000 people, uh, including schools, including community centers. Um, over 5,000 people presented for medical screening after this, after this contamination event. About uh, half to three quarters of them uh, had symptoms consistent with petroleum exposure, uh, including nausea, gastrointestinal issues, uh, hair loss, ulcers. And the thing is, we don't know what the long-term effects may be uh, for these folks. So the CDC has actually set up a registry to, kind, to try and keep track of what happens to them over the long-term uh, because they're essentially now a case study for what happens when you ingest petroleum. Uh, about 3,000 uh, uh, military families are also now, you know, there's no running water or there's no safe running water in their home. So the Navy's been putting them in hotels. Uh, there's also civilians that aren't, that are on the Navy system, but aren't military. And so they have even harder time getting support. Uh, it's not clear uh, whether and how they'll get reimbursed, for example, if they uh, want to relocate. And they're also being charged rent by their, um, their private contracted landlords. So they're, you know, a lot of them are stuck because they can't afford rent and then also pay up front for hotel um, costs that might, they may or may not be reimbursed for. Um, and thus far, the Department of Defense has spent about a quarter billion dollars to just try and rectify the current situation, which is still ongoing. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this figure went north of a half billion uh, before things start um, getting back to normal. Um, and after all of this, finally, the Department of Health issued an emergency order uh, to defuel Red Hill, to get the fuel um, out of this facility away from a drinking water aquifer. Um, this is just a heat, a heat map of uh, where people were reporting symptoms uh, that were consistent with petroleum exposure uh, after the, the contamination event. So it's pretty widespread. Again, about 93,000 people around this system. Um, and this is a, um, a military spouse, oh, sorry which I will, just kind of talking about her experiences. The other damage to vital organs. Why have you told us that the water was safe to drink, to bathe in while you really waited for results that you already had? I'm here to ask why you weren't a woman to protect my 13 month old son that I was bathing him when I was giving him a sippy cup full of water from my faucet when he has been throwing up for days on end. I'm here to ask why you weren't my wingman. As my husband and I have had mysterious symptoms such as sore throats, burning in my stomach, profuse, unusual sweating, headaches, unable to be mitigated, requiring multiple ER visits for additional medications, vomiting, diarrhea, skin irritation. I'm here to ask why you weren't there protecting my family when we made the heartbreaking choice to put my beloved dog down after a mysterious illness and thousands of dollars trying to discover why suddenly after being healthy, she was having coughing, choking, vomiting, difficulty breathing, loss of appetite, depression, general weakness, intermittent dry and oily feces, shivering, head tremors, lack of coordination and dehydration, because suddenly it now makes sense why she would seemingly go days without drinking water and then vomit after drinking some. I did I dare say that you murdered my dog, but causation is not correlation, so I am left to speculate. At this point, I... 
Um, uh, and uh, it, it's really heartbreaking uh, to hear what these folks have been going through. Um, I mean, it's like, you, you don't really realize how important water is uh, in your daily lives until you don't have it. Um, and then to, on top of that, be, you know, for the folks that were poisoned to have to um, not only deal with the conditions, the acute conditions that arose, but also the potential long-term effects that, um, that may occur due to the petroleum exposure. Um, and, and as bad as, as that as a current situation is, I think it's also uh, what people are starting to realize is that this crisis, we're not, this crisis is not done with us. Um, so if you, if you see, this is just a groundwater tracer model on, um, which indicates how groundwater, which flows may flow different from um, you know, petroleum or other contaminants, but this is how groundwater could flow from the, the facility, uh, which is on that right-hand side, um, to the, the various shafts that provide water um, to uh, both the military and the, and the um, municipal systems. Um, and because, because of that, because of the risk of migration of this plume, the Board of Water Supply has shut their wells down. Um, the Navy only has one well left that's pumping. It's in Y Alva, so it's, it's a bit further west. Um, and, but we don't know where this plume is or, or where it's going or how big it is even. And so until we get that information, we can't turn our wells back on, uh, which means water conservation mandates, especially in the summer, potentially, as, as, as demand increases, uh, which not only means that folks won't be able potentially to you know, fill their swimming pools or wash their cars, water their gardens, um, you know, we're looking at restrictions on construction, on, on water permits for new housing, which we desperately, desperately need in, in the midst of our affordable housing crisis. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be enough water to support the 10 million tourists that are expected to come through the islands this year, especially during the summer, uh, and tourism being one of our uh, major uh, economic industries could mean, you know, further economic impacts on the line. And this doesn't, this isn't just for this summer, potentially, un unless we can find a way to, again, uh, track this plume uh, and determine whether we can turn these wells back on or if we have to build new wells, you know, these impacts could persist for potentially years down the line. Uh, and as bad as this current crisis is, it can definitely get worse. So there's over hundred million gallons of fuel that continue to remain in this facility over hundred feet. I mean, just hundred feet above our groundwater aquifer. Uh, these tanks we also know are actively corroding. Um, so essentially after a big spill in 2014, uh, the Navy entered into what's called an administrative order on consent. And as part of that, they had to evaluate their, ta their tank inspection and repair process. Uh, and so essentially they, they uh, inspected the tank and I'll talk a little bit about how that works, so it doesn't work in, in a second, but they inspected the tank and then broke pieces off, samples or coupons off of the, the tank walls that they had inspected uh, to kind of ground truth whether or not the inspection process had uh, was, was actually sufficient. Uh, it turns out when they broke these pieces off and they took the concrete out, off, outside of the steel liner of the tanks, there's moisture trapped. There's this, a space and moisture trap between the concrete and the metal. And so when you have metal and moisture together, that causes corrosion, that causes rust. And so we know all of the coupons had, had active corrosion going on. Um, uh, and, and so in terms of their inspection process, because of this concrete, they can't actually see where the corrosion is happening. And so uh, what, what they do is on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that's an empty tank. And that, that, that's actually on the bottom right is a person suspended from the ceiling with a handheld scanner and a monitor. And he's trying to indirectly gauge where the tank walls may be so corroded that they need repairs. Uh, this is an inherently unreliable process as was proven when they did the, they took the coupons off the tank. It turns out that uh, all of the 10 coupons, four of them uh, missed the mark. So two coupons, the, the inspection process had said, hey, it's the tanks uh, fine here. You don't need to repairs. And it turned out it wasn't fine. It had actually corroded to the point where they needed, um, it needed repairs or it needed a be to be patched essentially, which is also an issue. Um, and then two of them, they had said, oh, it needs to be repaired here. And it, it actually hadn't corroded to the point where it would have triggered um, the repair requirements. So uh, under the Navy standards. So again, it's, it's not a very precise or accurate way to determine if you know, a hundred, uh, you know, 10 million gallons of fuel <laughs> are, is being safely stored in a tank. Um, and that's for the tanks that were inspected. So right now of the 14 tanks filling them, eight of them have not been inspected in over two decades. Uh, three of those haven't been inspected in over 38 years, uh, if not 40 years. And so we don't, we have no idea what the conditions of these tanks are. And they, again, they have fuel in them. They have millions of gallons of fuel in them. 
Um, and that's the only thing that really keeps these keeps the um, uh, the fill inside of the tank. It's the only thing that can prevent leaks from happening. Um, so this is just a, a picture of the back side of the walls from one of the coupons. Like they're all pretty indicate. Y'all had indications of of, of corrosion. Um, so in some cases, up to a, a third, uh, over two thirds of their width had been corroded away. Um, the Navy also has, or the, for for this facility, a, a couple a couple other systems to detect leaks. Uh, However, this system does not detect slow leaks. So up to 2,400 gallons of fuel could be released from a single tank uh, without any alarms going out off or any indication that something's wrong, uh, which is bad for a couple of reasons. One, you don't want you know, constant chronic releases of, of fuel into the environment from the tank, so especially when it's so close to a water source. And, and two, you, I mean, if you have unknown, the unknown presence of, of, of fuel outside of these tanks uh, combined with something like an electrical spark or another explosion like they had last year and, and that, that hits concrete and causes sparks and ignites the fuel, like that's, that could be catastrophic. Um, and the Navy's own assessment, uh, risk assessment, uh, expects an annual loss of about 5,000 gallons, uh, which is, again, that's not great. And then when you think about over time, you know, 10 years, that's 50,000 gallons. That's an ex expected chronic release from this facility. Uh, and also, the Navy cannot prevent certain major risk factors like earthquakes. Um, so in 1948, there was a big earthquake that hit this island. Uh, 46,000 gallons uh, were released uh, from a tank as a result. And this was back when the tanks were brand new. And this was 1948. And so now the tanks are 80 years old. Another big one like that could be catastrophic. Um, the Navy's system cannot prevent human error, uh, which is the suspected causes of the big spill in 2014, uh, as well as a spill in May of last year. Um, and again, you combine you know, human error with other weaknesses in the system, you could have some catastrophic outcomes. Um, uh, just like, you know, some of the major, the large, biggest environmental disasters uh, in our in recent history, um, all you know, had human error as, as contributing factors. Um, and so what happens if there's a, a catastrophic spill, like maybe a million gallons out of 10 million gallons gets released, right? This current crisis, which they think was a result of 19,000 gallons, uh, being leaked is it will be dwarfed, right? It's it's it, uh, we can't we would not be able to clean the aquifer. Uh, it's it's not like a big swimming pool we can go in and suck stuff up. It's it's like porous rock, and so you, there's really no way to get in there and and and, and remediate a, a big release like that. Uh, the worst case scenario is is we don't know where the plume is and and we suck some of the petroleum into the municipal system, uh, which means we're pretty much our water system's pretty much done. Um, uh, best case scenario in that kind of event is there's no contamination in our system, but we lose access to a fairly significant amount of our island's water supply, so 20% or more, uh, which means that uh, we'll have, we'll be seeing environmental, like the cultural impacts, impacts to our housing, to our education system, basically every aspect of life on this island will be impacted. And not just for a few years, like we're seeing this current crisis, but potentially for generations. Um, which brings us to the uh, the logical goals of our campaign, which is defuel this facility and shut it down permanently so we'll never have to be in a crisis like this again. Um, and so I guess right now I'm going to stop sharing and let Kimo uh, talk about some of the legal interventions uh, and legal developments that have been, uh, we've been engaging in and also in some of the history um, with that. Um, so Kimo, you can take it away. All right. <clears throat> so um, RICRA has a provision like many federal environmental laws that specifically allows states and local entities to regulate underground storage tanks. Um, the provision in RICRA is probably more sweeping and explicit than some of the provisions in say the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, et cetera. Um, and in uh, 1986, our state made its first steps into enacting an underground storage tank law. Uh, it was pretty vague, uh, but the program was supposed to start uh, sometime soon in 1992, major amendments were made to the law. And the legislature specifically required the State Department of Health to enact rules to prevent releases by 1998. Uh, as it turned out, the Department of Health didn't adopt rules until after 1998. It was not until the year 2000. Uh, when those uh, rules were enacted. And I would say it's fair to say um, their action was under the radar screen for a lot of folks focused on other issues, including me. Um, 
the um, there was a big release, as Wayne mentioned, in uh, 2014, and there was a uh, legislative task force that came up with a report in 2015 that sort of outlined the the ramifications of the facility and the work that needed to be done to address this inherently dangerous uh, facility. <clears throat> I was um, contacted back then, approximately 2015, and, you know, we need to sue over this. But what do you sue over? And I have to say, it took me a long time to figure out what we could do. It's not something I thought about every day for weeks on end, but you think about it. I don't, I don't know how we, what we can do, who do we sue, what's the legal violation, et cetera. Finally, in um, 2017, we figured it out that um, the state law uh, that required the regulation of underground storage tanks uh, is, is sweeping. It has some exemptions that are similar to federal law, but apart from those discrete uh, exceptions, the law has broad applicability. Yet when the Department of Health had enacted its rules, it specifically exempted what are called field constructed tanks. Those are underground storage tanks that are built in the field as opposed to buying a pre-assembled tank and, and installing it. Uh, and those are essentially what the military has um, in various places in the state. So there was this exemption and we realized that um, that exemption was not warranted. We sued and uh, our environmental court found that the Department of Health rules were inconsistent with the statute and struck down the rules and required new rules be enacted um, by mid-July of 2018. So the Department of Health did that, which required the Navy for the first time to require, to submit an application for a permit. They were required a, a permit to operate their tanks. In fact, that requirement has been in the law. They, they, they have needed a permit since July 2019. They still do not have a permit. So it's fair to say that the Navy's tanks have been operating illegally since 2019. They applied in March 2019. Sierra Club requested a contested case hearing. Um, and the Department of Health dragged its feet on that request. And then the Board of Water Supply uh, made a request as well. And um, Department of Health dragged its feet. Uh, we got nervous. Uh, and there's there was a provision in the underground storage tank rules that allow for automatic approval of applications. We sued to strike down that provision is inconsistent with the state constitution and state law. And uh, we, the Department of Health amended its rules and got rid of that provision. Uh, Theoretically, the contested case hearing procedure began in 2019 over the permit, um, but we dealt with procedural issues for more than a year, and the live testimony portion did not begin until February of 2021, so just about a year ago, a year and a month ago. We had, we had testimony in July 2021. The case was reopened briefly because there was a May 2021 release, and we wanted to get some of that evidence in the record. Um, and then the hearings officer came up with a recommended decision, which was a, uh, a split the baby kind of decision. Uh, they, he recommended granting the, um, the Navy the permit, but requiring that all the tanks that hadn't been inspected in two decades or more be shut down, which is about 40% of the tanks. Then uh, a bunch of uh, stories broke including a uh, whistleblower ha had a bunch of internal emails that went to uh, Civil Beat, which is one of the uh, online um, newspapers here. Uh, and then there was a surge incident at the end of September. Uh, all this triggered a need to reopen the hearing. And while that uh, motion was being considered, we had the big November 20th uh, release of who knows, 19,000 gallons. Uh, December 6th, the Department of Health issued its emergency order requiring cleanup, but also def uh, defueling all the tanks. There was a contested case hearing. Uh, Earth Justice represented the Sierra Club in that matter. And the um, really compelling testimony it was a two-day 
just a short two-day hearing, a lot of documents and evidence. Um, the hearings officer uh, upheld the emergency order as did the deputy director who affirmed the hearings officer's order and the Navy has filed a state appeal in state court, which is unusual uh, in the sense that Navy is rarely in state courts, but they've also filed a federal lawsuit challenging the emergency order. The Navy claims that they are complying with the emergency order as they challenge it, but the Department of Health has disagreed with that, as has uh, as does the Sierra Club. So that's sort of a nutshell version of the sort of legal issues here. And back to you, Wayne. Thanks, Kimo. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a legal landscape of, of, of this campaign. Uh, I will, let's see. Uh, there's a couple other other fronts. Um, so on a legislative front, front there's some state bills that have been enacted uh, to either uh, prohibit uh, underground storage tanks or free constructed tanks of over 100,000 gallons capacity, or prohibit those tanks Malka of or um, in inland, I guess, of the uh, underground injection uh, control line, which is a which is a line established by the state uh, safe drinking water branch where you don't wanna put injection wells um, inland of, of, of that line because then you'll be injecting wastewater right into a drinking water aquifer. Um, there's, the city has actually passed the bill and the mayor has signed the bill. Uh, as Kimo mentioned, uh, both state and local governments can provide further regulations on underground storage tank systems. And so the city has uh, taken that opportunity to pass a bill that would prohibit or would require permits for any underground storage tank facility that's uh, over 100,000 gallons capacity. And to get a permit, the applicant has to prove that the system, their facility won't leak uh, hazardous or regulated substances over its lifetime, which is, there's no possible way that you know, for the Red Hill situation, maybe could meet that burden. Uh, there's also uh, in Congress, there's, uh, there's $350 million in funding that was just passed, uh, $100 million to get the Navy the funds to comply with the emergency order specifically, and then $250 million uh, to um, pay for the cost of dealing with the current crisis. Uh, and, and, and most recently, our, both our Senator and, and Representatives uh, delegates uh, have introduced uh, what's called a Y Act, or Watershed Aquifer Accountability Initiative Act, which is um, essentially would uh, require the Navy to shut down Red Hill, um, to defuel it by the end of the year, and, and, and to begin the process of shutting it down. Uh, so hopefully it will disabuse them of the idea that they could somehow continue operating this facility in the future, which is I think partly what's contributing to the foot dragging. Um, and then it would also require uh, that the um, Board of Water Supply, the Department of Education, other, other state agencies are reimbursed for the cost of dealing with the current crisis. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's, the, that's kind of the legislative landscape. Um, and then there's the grassroots, uh, which is, I think, where, um, where, where I think the ultimately, you know, folks can get engaged and, and, and make the biggest difference in, in, in dealing with the situation before it, it's too late. Um, so our Goal again, it's it's defilling Red Hill and shutting it down permanently, getting that established as a policy of the federal government. Um, the decision makers in this campaign um, are the commander in chief, uh, who's the you know the, the commander in chief of the military, and 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 as well as congressional delegates, not just ours but those of other jurisdictions that may be key um, to achieving these goals. Uh, and then we were thinking about you know okay, so these are the, the key decision makers. So who can influence influence these folks? And so we're still continuing to strategize and think around that. But you know, obvious, I think candidates would be former President Obama, who was born in Oahu, who drank water from this aquifer, who was President Joe Biden's president when Joe Biden was Vice President. Um, other folks like uh, Deb Holland with the Department of Interior, uh, uh, EPA Director Mike Reagan, who actually was in town just last week or a couple of weeks ago um, to kind of sort out what's going on with the Red Hill situation. So other people basically in the in the president's cabinet or in his in the sphere of influence that might be able to reach him. Um, we're really trying to get the Board of Education to reach out to the U.S. Secretary of Education just as another voice. I mean, all, all of these secondary targets, you know, they're they're not as powerful as the Pentagon, but to the extent we can keep this noise around. Um, the president and let them know that not only are we flirting with complete disaster for our island, but we're also looking at potentially staining his legacy and, and the reputation of our, of our of the United States uh, should the unthinkable happen. So Wayne, let me just interact, interject, yeah. go back to that slide if you can. Um, somebody asked what folks on the mainland can do. 
So the, the simplest thing you can do, um, and it, it may not seem like a lot, but it's important um, if you can reach out to your U.S. Senator, uh, congressional representative to convey the importance of uh, getting the Navy to shut down the red, defuel and shut down the Red Hill facility. Even, uh, I mean, one letter to the president is not gonna make a difference, but thousands will. So um, that's, that's uh, at, at a minimum, those kinds of things are, are things that, that folks can do. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thanks, Emil. Yeah, absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Um, uh, and, and so a couple other things, tactics that we're taking on, uh, we have a Red Hill Pledge website, um, which we, uh, where basically every elected official, uh, community organizations, individuals uh, can sign on to a pledge committing to supporting essentially the shutdown of, of, of the Red Hill facility. Um, we're hoping that we can leverage this into uh, corporate sponsorships that can help us buy ad space in, in major national publications that will you know, keep the discourse and elevate and keep the discourse going on a national level, especially in DC uh, regarding the need to deal with the situation. Um, we are also have a, a collective X petition um, that um, is tar it's directed at President Obama and, and Biden, and uh, it, it's also on our website. Um, and we're hoping uh, to use that petition to uh, directly reach out to uh, to these key folks. Um, and we're also planning a potential March twenty second action in DC. So that's World Water Day. Um, uh, uh, just just that's that's the significance of that date. Um, um, yeah, and then uh, uh, definitely uh, if folks want to learn more and stay engaged, and uh, at the last slide, we'll have our, our website, but if you go to sierraclubhawaii.org slash Red Hill, uh, that's, uh, you can sign up for action alerts and get more information um, and also see all the news updates that are pretty much every day um, coming out, whether in local or, or other publications. Um, and so just as a final reflection um, before we do Q&A, um, you know, just, we, our island's been blessed, like incredibly blessed to have this incredibly abundant and pure resource. Um, this Red Hill facility has been threatening it for the past 80 years. It's now definitely absolutely contaminated it um, and is continuing to contaminate it um, as, as we speak. And, and we just cannot sit back and watch uh, this source of life for millennia go down on our watch and, and, and take with it our, our economy, our way of life, uh, our environmental resources, our, our food security, you know, for, for decades, for generations potentially. And so, you know, our goal here is to be the generation that finally takes out this 80 year old menace once and for all. Um, and yeah, and so with that, um, again, that's that's the website, sierraclubhoy.org slash Red Hill, uh, where you can learn more. Uh, folks can also email me uh, at my email address um, at the bottom of this slide. And yeah, and I'll stop sharing and then maybe we can field some, field some questions. Wonderful. Um, thank you both so much for speaking. It looks like we have another question um, from Jessica Noon. Um, Jessica says, oh, sorry, Jesse, um, Jesse Noon. Um, Jesse says, I'm doing research on this topic currently as a graduate student at UO, um, raised in Kauai. Um, given the prioritization of the Moanalua Aquifer and the Halalua, oh, sorry for the pronunciation. Um, is it valid um, to connect this crisis of the misuse of water in Hawaiian land laws um, in the Aupua system in the context of environmental justice? Um, are there any grassroots campaigns that are advocating for uh, di different um, indigenous water management to be prioritized? Um, if either of you would like to answer this question, it's open. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, can, I can take a, take a shot. Um, but you know, I think absolutely there are, are connections uh, between what's going on and, and a number of other water issues that have been particularly imp impactful in the Hawaiian community. Um, so if you look at the history of, of Hawaii uh, and, and our current laws even, um, they're all based on this idea, uh, this traditional understanding of water uh, as a public trust resource. So essentially it's so precious, so essential to life that it cannot be privatized. And, and in fact, it's, it's a responsibility of those with in power to ensure its rightful sharing and conservation and protection, not just for the current generation, but for, gen for generations to come. And, and, and despite this understanding since basically time immemorial, what we've seen over the last 
couple of centuries is a, is a con continual erosion of the foundations of this politics understanding. Uh, you know, uh, whether it's the, the displace, displacement and disenfranchisement of the Native Hawaiian community, the takeover aided by the US Navy uh, and the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom, which then facilitated, you know, uh, even further drastic changes um, to how, uh, to policy governance environment in Hawaii. So when you have plantation owners and oligarchy essentially making decisions as to how resources are to be distributed, what policies are prioritized, what social issues to be addressed, um, and, and and, and you can kind of see how, you know, for generations now we've we've been de we've been departing from um, these fundamental understandings, especially as it comes to water. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, and so I, I see these things as connected in a lot of ways. A lot of other issues we've we've been dealing with in terms of um, the effective privatization and commodification of water, notwithstanding our constitution and laws uh, and case laws. Um, uh, the disenfranchisement of uh, Native Hawaiian communities and the favoring of, of, of folks that have inherited their power from, you know, from this history of oligarchy. Um, and, and there's absolutely now a uh, grassroots um, uh, Native Hawaiian mobilization um, around um, this Red Hill situation. So in that, I think the second to last side, there's a, there's a coalition called Kohibai Coalition, which is a number of Native Hawaiian groups have come together. Uh, they actually, we actually like drove up in the, in the, like 4 a.m. to Pacific Base Headquarters Command, uh, Pacific Base Command Headquarters, and they erected a koa, uh, which kind of like an altar structure, um, which now serves as kind of a, a gathering place for folks to um, um, to to visit and and to do protocol and and, and to and to um, and help get engaged on uh, protecting our water, um, and yeah, uh, I don't know if Kimo, you had any other. So. so I don't know if I really understand the questions, but I'm going to answer this in a, in a different way than, than, than Wayne just did. Um, this let me give you some context, different context. So the um, military, I guess it's the army. I'm not maybe it's the navy. I think it was actually the navy um, bombed Koolave for decades um, and failed to clean it up. There is live ordinance um, on Koolave still. Um, some of it's been cleaned up to a depth of four feet, but it is not uh, cleaned up to the extent that it needs to be. Um, Pohakaloa uh, on the Big Island, the military, uh, we have a court decision which, which, which recognized the degree of damage that the uh, military, I guess there it's the um, army, has degraded the landscape. At Makua Valley, the site of uh, a bunch of litigation, um, the military has destroyed cultural sites and uh, has a miserable track record. Uh, Waikani uh, Valley, I believe it is, um, where uh, a private property was taken during the war uh, and littered with landscape uh, with, with uh, unexploded ordnance, rendering it uh, unusable for farming, et cetera. So uh, part of the context is sort of the military's disregard for natural resources, whether it's land or water. Um, the, the idea being they're there to protect us, but they can destroy us at the same time in order as they attempt to protect us. So anyway, that's a long answer. Um, we have an anonymous attendee asking, has anyone thought about applying for sole source aquifer status from EPA um, for the aquifer under the Safe Drinking Water Act? So yes, her name is Hazel Cunningham. I think I've got this right. She actually was the one who petitioned for this to be a sole source aquifer back in the 70s. Um, and so yes, it is. it has been designated as a sole source aquifer, which is something we cite often, um, but that label in and of itself doesn't necessarily prevent it from being contaminated. All right, thank you for answering. Um, we'll continue to be taking questions, um, but in the meantime, um, I have a few here. Um, so I was curious, you were saying that the Navy is suing you um, for, over the emergency order, is that correct? or? I thought I heard you say that, um, Kimo. Um, how is that lawsuit sort of underway? Um, and how, how has that been proceeding? Um, 
So there's they, they filed two actions. I'm going to use that word. Um, one is an appeal in state court, which is a pretty and by the, and by the way, the two suits are virtually identical. They're just different forums or a little bit of forum shopping going on. Um, the um, they're not contesting that the state has the authority to uh, uh, regulate the Navy's Red Hill tanks. That's not an issue. They're quibbling over parts of the emergency order, um, some procedural, some substantive. Um, obviously, the main defendant or appellee is the Department of Health. But because of Sierra Club intervened, we are parties as well. So we are going to help defend the Department of Health's decision. So there's the appeal in state court, and they've filed a separate action in federal court, which is, like I say, virtually identical to the state one, but they're trying to have it in federal court. And so that there'll be a big, there is a, a big battle in terms of whether the proceedings are going to proceed in state court, federal court, or both. And I was wondering, you said you were trying to reach out or get the attention of President Biden or former President um, Barack Obama. I was wondering if you have heard any response from those individuals or any of the other people that you were reaching out to and sort of how um, our federal government has chosen to highlight or not highlight this issue? Um, yeah, we've, uh, we haven't heard back directly from the president, from President Biden or, or Obama. Um, we've sent numerous letters and petitions and, and not just to him, but to um, uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, uh, who did, you know, they, they respond, but it's not really, you know, it's it's a it's it's nothing really concrete, <laughs> um, and and so you know we just need to keep you know I think keep the noise up, keep the keep the pressure on, and, and spread as much awareness as we can um, um, through whatever actions um, that we can think of. All right, and and I was curious. Um, you said that part of your campaign was buying ad space in the media. Um, have you been finding that the media has been reticent to find their own uh, motivation to cover your situation. Um, I, if you could speak to that. Um, so yeah, uh, we've had some hits and some in some um, na national and even international uh, news publications uh, like Guardian, uh, Yomi Uri Shimbun in Japan. Um, we're hoping that there'll be, and I know there's been some other folks that have come to town to kind of document what's going on. Uh, like Al Jazeera and, and Vice, and um, which which aren't, you know, I think it, it's it, it, you know any exposure is, is good, especially on, on a national level. Um, we really want to look at. We're really hoping for hits in some of the more, um, I guess, some of the publications that are, tend to be read more in DC, um, like Washington Post, like maybe uh, New York Times and other places. So we haven't. Um, we, I think there was one thing that was came out in the Washington Post a, a, a month or two ago. Um, but you know, as it'd be good, I think, to continue uh, shooting for those publications. And I think, but with the ad space, hopefully, they'll also get attention of other media outlets that can um, that might be um, interested in, in digging more into the issue. But the local media has been all over the story. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. All right. Um, if no one else has any questions, I'll just give a little bit of time in case anyone has a last thought or question to submit. Um, but, you know, if we don't have any more, I, I think we've had a really wonderful panel. Um, thank you so much, both of our panelists, for coming and educating us a little more on this issue. And uh, we'll be looking out um, to see how it progresses. And uh, thank you to all of our attendees for coming today. Um, and I hope you take care and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Um, really glad for folks' engagement.